Production underwriting for The New Americans is provided by the Ray Daba Local Production Challenge Fund and the members of KCSM who generously responded. Everybody, I'm Jan Yanahiro, and welcome to the New Americans, Pacific Islanders. Specifically, we're talking with people from three nations in the South Pacific, Tonga, Samoa, and Fiji. All the islands are located below the equator, but north of Australia and New Zealand. You know, the urge to find a better life, especially for their children, brings a lot of Polynesians to the United States. According to the 1990 census, nearly 100,000 Polynesians of Tongan, Samoan, and Fijian ancestry live in the United States. But the issues they face here are complex and challenging, and often conflict with their cultures. With us today are three people, all born in the islands, now living here in the United States. Nancy Loma was born and raised in Tonga. She is the executive director of the Polynesian Community Services, a service that serves San Mateo and Santa Clara counties in California. Nancy, can you tell us what kinds of services you provide? We have three components. Uh, we have a um, educational component, um, for example, um, providing um, tutoring, mm -hmm. uh, mentor, college preparation. We also have a social service. Um, we provide like referral and informational for um, employment. Excellent, and the third? Um, and the third one is cultural. Uh, we teach the community at large about the Polynesian culture. Great, thank you. Jesse Sapolo is a well-known name in the sports world. He's an offensive lineman with the San Francisco 49ers. Born in Western Samoa, he went to school in Hawaii. Thanks for joining us, Jesse. You know, there is a perception that a lot of Polynesians are all jocks. Is this fair, you think? I think it's totally unfair. Uh, I think, unfortunately, that the most visible Polynesians are ones that play professional football. And for that reason, people come up with that unfair assessment, but I disagree with that. Okay. And our third guest, Salesi Kataonga, is from the island of Fiji. He's been here three years. He's an undergraduate student at Santa Clara University in California and was the first student body president of Polynesian Heritage at the College of San Mateo in California. Now, Salesi, I understand you are planning to return to Fiji when you complete your educational studies here. Is that true? Yes, that's right, Jen. I, uh, I think there's a need for young professionals back home, and hopefully I can take back some of the things I've learned here in California and the United States to help our people in our country. We wish you well in that Thank venture. You. you know, earlier I met with some young Pacific Islanders, and they told me about the issues that concern them. You know, when I first came here, I wasn't accepted, you know. I wasn't black, Mexican, white. And if even though, you know, there wasn't too many Polynesians around in where I stayed at. If they're going to look at you and see that you're different, you have to kind of prove yourself, you know, kind of, and show them that you're not this bad person that they see mm -hmm. in their eyes. Just like you said, that's all like people think we we're good at is being muscles, you know? Uh, they'd say, you know, football's the only thing I can do, and that's all we're good for. We always get in trouble, drink, smoke, you know, we're gangsters. And uh, that's not true. Promiscuous is a stereotype that a lot of people put on Polynesian young women. That is um, not true with me. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for me to accept their culture. It's like, Steph, let's go out. Oh, no, I have to stay home. Steph, let's do this. I have to go to church. I'm like, oh. Tongan families are really tight. Third, fourth cousins are just like, um, they're just like brothers and sisters to you. I think the main purpose is why a lot of Polynesians came to, the, to America, was, you know, to get a better education for the, their kids. And like, as time goes on, the, you know, the parents aren't always there to, you know, reinforce that, that we came here for you guys to get an education, but, and, you know, they're always out working. You know, what the parents have to do is talk to them about what the culture is really about, about especially the kids that grew up here. See, I never really dated a girl my, that's Polynesian, you know, until now. 
Oh, my mom, you know, she tries to scare me sometimes. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm very she, she, tells, she tells me, you know, if you don't pick a good one, I'm going to take you back, fly back with you on the island, pick a <laughs> wife over the weekend. That's, I remember talking to my my dad about it, and he says that we're going go, to we're gonna do the traditional ways. I'm going to look for your husband. Each and every one of us prove a stereotype wrong each day. I mean, Ed, Tim, T, Stephanie, all of us do. I, I earned a Fulbright scholarship to University of Pacific, and, you know, I, I'm trying to set an example. I'm, I'm trying to set an example to the others, you know, especially my younger brothers and sisters. Yeah, you know, sure. we can do it. It's a matter of how hard we try. These are significant issues that Polynesians face here in the United States. I'd like to turn to our audience now and see if they have any questions for our guests. Let's see. How about you? What would you like to ask our guests? Um, who were some of your role models? Role when you, models? Yeah, when you were growing up. Good. Jesse, let's start with you. What about role models? Did you have any role models growing up? Well, I, I don't think uh, I really had role models as far as athletes are concerned. I had an idol. Well, I think the, the role model for me was my dad. Because? Uh, because he worked so hard in instilling my Polynesian ways and my Samoan tradition within me. And even to this day, you know, with uh, professional sports, with all the drugs and all the corruption that's involved in it, I always reach back and I said, Jess, are you moving too fast? Uh, will your dad be disappointed in you if you act a certain way? And that brings me back and he holds me back and he keeps me out of trouble from the fast pace of life in professional sports. Good, good to hear that. Nancy, what about for you? I mean, uh, and I think that some of us here in the audience know that you were a singer in Tonga, uh, but what about you? W did you have any role models growing up? Um, I think I have the same answer as Jesse. My role model was my dad, too. Uh, my dad was a church minister at that time, and you know how that was. You know, it was very strict on me, but at the same time, you know, even today I really appreciate it because of where I am today and how success I am with my life right now. If it was not for my dad, you know, I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't be here, I mean, on stage right now. <laughs> but so. now, would you say for a lot of Polynesians coming to the United States to seek a better life and everything else for education, that the role models may be lacking because I know in your program you provide role models. Correct. You think there's a lack of it here? Um, I think so and I think that's one of the reason why I really wanted to start this program with the Polynesian Community Services is because uh, we need to show the, the Polynesian students, the youth out there here in America that you know um, to teach them some kind of uh, of um, role model in, in a way and also um, like Jesse here you know we um, I know with the youth that we've been working with you know they look up to Jesse so much not only he's an F, you know athletic person but he's also I mean he's so successful you know educational and and also with his um, kids and also with what he's doing with the 49ers so so that's important role mm -hmm. models and so Lacey you know you return your plan in return but um, you were you were kind of a role model for a lot of kids. You were the first student body president of <laughs> Polynesian descent here at the College of San Mateo. I mean, you are serving as a role model. So do you feel that's true? At the time, at the time I was I was doing it, I wasn't really thinking along those terms. But as as we worked uh, further in, in, into the community, I realized that there was a need for uh, role models amongst the Polynesians, and um, it dawned on me that the work that I was doing was going to probably be used as a yardstick for, po for the Polynesian students that were coming on later. And I'm really pleased with, wh with what's happened with the growth of the Polynesian Club and their organization. And I'm really happy with the work that they're doing, especially reaching out to the students and um, to other families in the community. And that's, that's something that I'm really proud of, what they've done. They've grown, and I think that's, that's an excellent. Well, I think a lot of them look to you as a role model, too. Thank um, you. Let's ask Caroline here. Do you have any uh, concerns or issues that you'd like to bring up to our guests? Well, um, I just want to know from an adult point of view, um, what are some of the um, differences that you notice between the uh, American-born Polynesians and Polynesians who were born back home in the islands who come here to settle and live? Oh, that's a good question. And, um, um, you know, Nancy, you've got five children. Maybe you can uh, um, answer that. You were born and raised in Tonga, and you came here. I Your was. children are born and raised here. You know, what about the, the cultural differences, the family ties? 
that you may not find so readily available here in the United States? I think the big difference that, um, that I observe here in, in the United States is um, the family, the type of family uh, life here and the type of family life back home. Back home, the, the family, the extended family, they're so close together. Here, you know, maybe one's living, it's not only because of miles from f between each other, but not only that, the t you know, everybody's so busy, you know, they cannot get together to share sometimes and to do like reunion with the families. Um, back home, you know, even though, I mean, Tonga is very small, um, for example, and everybody watch out for everyone. Like here, you know, if I want to go somewhere, I know I have to to pay a babysitter and it's really expensive to pay somebody here. Back in Tonga, if I want to go to a meeting, I would just dump my kids with my mom and dad or my neighbor or whoever I see, you know, hey, take care of my kids, I'll be back in two hours. And that's nothing for them. Here, you say, take care of my two kids, they say, give me $40, you know, before I take care of your kids. So, it's you know, different lifestyle. right, Absolutely different lifestyle. Right. But, but one thing is, Jen, that I want to, um, that I would like to comment to on, on our culture, I think with the, the parents here in the United States, and I'm just talking from my Tongan perspective, um, I think that they should not bring their 100% culture and, and expect to keep it here in America. They have to give up something, you know, to acquire something else. For example, let me give you a specific example. Like say, like students, you know, um, for example, when they go to school, you know, there is something called prompt night, you know, there's something called a reunion night, you know. and Back in Tonga, I would let my daughter go to the prom by herself. You know, I would say, well, stay here. You're too young to go out by yourself. You know, I, I wouldn't even let her go out with her friends. I have to either I have to go or else she'll stay yeah. home. You know? So it's different. You're saying right, it's back. different. Here, you have to let your kids socialize a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. so. Well, that's a good point. Now, Jesse, your dad, you've got children, mm -hmm. and you were kind of born and raised in Tuai. You were born in Samoa but raised in Hawaii, now living here. I mean, how do you feel about that in the, bringing the culture and the family ties to the, main, to the United States? Well, you know, it's tough. Uh, only because uh, when you come to America, you need to learn the, the social part of becoming successful in America. And uh, for a lot of the kids, when they come here from Samoa or Tonga or Fiji, uh, they know one culture, and they're very proud of that culture. But when they come to the United States, they find out that some of those cultural things that they're very proud of are looked down upon here in America. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, uh, their, their self-esteem goes down a little bit, their confidence goes down a little bit, and they, res they resort to, well, I'm nobody now, so I'm going to be a gangbanger. Uh, that's the way that I can be somebody in the United States. But that's not true. Uh, for me personally, I came here from, from Samoa. I didn't speak a word of English. And it was very tough for me in the school system. Uh, but I had to fight. And I had to fight in a way of being mentally tough and believing in myself. And always be conscious of the fact that when I do something, care enough for my people to not do something that will make them ashamed of me. Mm -hmm. And as long as I have that conscious, then I know that I'll be a good human being. And even now, with my status as a professional athlete, and a well-known professional football player, I'm always <coughs> more nervous about speaking to 50 Samoan people or 50 Polynesian people than talking in front of 5,000 Americans because I've, I'm always so conscious of what, what do they think of me. Uh, do they think I'm now thinking I'm better than they are because I have a job that society puts up on a pedestal? So I'm always conscious of that. But if the Polynesian kids feel like as long as they can move forward and be mentally tough and not do anything to make the Tongan people disappointed or their Fijians disappointed, then they'll be good human beings and not rebel to the standpoint where their, their self-esteem goes way down yeah. just to be accepted and they go out and do something dramatic. Problems and people are either real good <laughs> or if you push them, they become yeah. real bad. And because that's their, that's their nature. And that's something that uh, like people like Nancy and, right. and her, uh, right. her group right. is helping out with. Yeah. Well, you don't have to be nervous with us. I mean, we're all for you, Jesse. I mean, you know, hey. Uh, so, Lacey, you were kind of smiling and laughing back there. I mean, you have a comment about this? No, I, um, Jesse touched on a good point about the differences, and so did Nancy. Um, there's a big difference that I see amongst my peers, and um, in that growing up, 
I never really questioned authority. There was always mom and dad telling you what to do or grandma or grandpa telling you what to do. And there was never ever that, that need to say why. And then when I came up to the United States, I see this question of authority coming up all the time, you know. Go take care of your little sister, why? You know, and uh, mm -hmm. go do this, who, you know, why should I? And um, that whole, the whole concept of questioning authority is, is something that I had a hard time dealing with. And it even went transpi transpired into the classroom where um, our traditional students are usually we sit down and, and take, you know, take, take what the teachers give us. And then I'm sitting in a classroom where students are actually asking the teacher, why, why is the form formula this or why do we do it this way? And that whole concept of asking, questioning was, was something I wasn't used to. And, so uh, how do you feel about it now? Are you in classroom saying, <laughs> professor, why it, do you, it took me why a while, you doing but, this? It took me a while, but I'm on the bandwagon now and All asking right. questions. So there you go. <laughs> Let's get up here and, and, and uh, find out some of uh, your issues and your concerns. Mm -hmm. um, lately in the Polynesian community, there's been a great outreach to those who are less fortunate than the average person. Why do you think that is right now instead of why it didn't happen like five years ago, ten years ago? Well, Nancy, you probably should take that one because your, you know, your service actually reaches out to right. some families, right? Yeah. I mean, is this true that this wasn't done five years ago? Um, I think it, it was true. Um, the only thing that I look at it, because there are more institutions uh, within the Polynesian communities nowadays, and I know that some of them reach out, like some of them, there, there is one, it's called Talama Fotonga, there is one, it's called Samoa, Mo Samoa. I think the Fijian have theirs. And Ours is Polynesian community, which bring the whole, these three population together. But, you know, apart from that, there are, you know, little communities, I mean, committees within the communities itself. And I think it's, and nowadays, the, we are doing better because we have more role models. And also, not only that, I found out that one thing is uh, the women's within the Polynesian community, we tend to open up to each other. We come together, have lunch or meet together, and just share our success and share our failure and also be able to motivate other uh, Polynesian um, women to get out there and go get a job or go take a class, you know, something like that and, and get on with their life. You know, so this so. is a neat adventure that wasn't, as you mentioned before, wasn't available five years ago, This the service that you provide now. Right. So this is one answer, one great solution to the, the community, the Polynesian community at large then. I Excellent think that's idea. one of the answers too. How about you? Can we ask uh, if you've got a question or a concern? What about some of the stereotypes? I mean, do you find that there are some stereotypes about Polynesians, you personally? You've heard some of the students talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> just a stereotype that are like talking to someone, all they do is like they want to beat up people or something. Like for, for example, like over here, when I was in high school, uh, all the other race were like scares of, of Polynesian. Because they think if you mess with one coconut, you're messing with a whole tree. <laughs> it's like a saying like that. And like I say, I think that all races are the same. You have a good and your bad people in all the race. There's no such thing as one bad race or one good race. Good point, good point. But, I mean, you know, Jesse, did you find this true? I mean, when you came over here, I mean, the stereotypes, as our guest so eloquently said, I mean, you mess with one, you mess with the whole tree. I mean, and the, well, the perception, the stereotypes, how do you feel you know, about that? I mean, I, I've had to deal with that, uh, climbing the ranks ever since uh, my high school days. You know, I was the biggest guy in school, you know, since I was a sophomore. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have a certain build. You know, we're not very tall, but we're big people and uh, thick bone people. But at the same time, there is some truth to it. And I think the one way we can solve it is, is for all of us to work together. You know, for us to completely deny it and say, the Polynesian kids don't go out and beat up people because we do, mm -hmm. just like any other race. True. But it happens that we don't have, uh, for example, with the 49ers, it's just me. And if I beat up somebody, all Samoans that play football beat up people because I'm, I'm only me. Uh, for example, Jerry Rice, for every Jerry Rice, there's also a Steve Wallace or a Guy McIntyre to take some of the pressure off of them. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a certain truth to it. And the thing for us, the way for us to solve it is to admit to it, find a way to solve it, mm -hmm. and move on and kill that, 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 that reputation that we have as, as Polynesian people. Excellent idea. I mean, so Lacey, would you agree to that? I, uh, I agree with the stereotypes. Because you're a big guy too. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, um, I agree with the stereotypes and the, you know, they'd be classified as violent people. And I think we as a group should probably reach beyond that. It's a given that we're physically big and we're physically strong 
and I think we've proven it, you know, as, as in Jesse's case and the audience, you can see they're pretty big guys. The physical part's taken care of. I think what we should probably do is start working on the other aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. Show them that we have the mental capacity to, right. co to cope with the problems. I mean, every time they look at us and they say, you know, don't make him mad, he's going to punch you. But now that, you know, you can talk to the guy, you can reason with him, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of things. If we can show them that we have that capability, that we can reason things out, you know, we're not going to hit you every time you look at me, but, you know, if we, we have the capabilities to solve our problems and, and like, take on the responsibilities that society gives us, I'm sure we'll be able to And I, to I should along. say that, Salesi, uh, to the audience, too, that uh, his <laughs> plans of becoming either a doctor or a lawyer or both. Sure, yeah. <laughs> no, and, no, no. and so we wish minutes. him the best. I mean, you know, speaking of uh, being big, Jesse, do you see this one guy in this audience? <laughs> well, well, can, can we have cameras? Can we have him stand up and show? Come on. <laughs> five three, okay. And here is this guy. Okay. Now you can sit down and tell me. Do you find that you know the stereotype about size? I mean, big as just you mentioned is uh, is an issue. Yes, because um, like in classrooms, sometimes you know teachers pick on you. They see you if you're talking, and you see another bunch of people talking. The teacher will pick on you since you're so big and you stick out from the whole group. And like when you're in school or something, and there's a fight. Everybody thinks, you know, if you're around the fight, everybody thinks you're involved because you were just around it. And, you you know, if you didn't do anything, everybody's going to say, I heard that you got in a fight and stuff like that. Because you're obviously a big guy. You stand out in the crowd. That, that, well, that's an issue where you heard some of what, what people are saying. Um, what are your concerns? What would you like to ask any of our guests? Um, when you guys first came to America, was it hard for you guys to go out, you know, like for your parents to let you go out, you know, as like, you know, since you guys came a long time ago, and I wasn't even born yet, but, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm That's just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. We get it. Because it's like, you know, like some parents, you know, they're Polynesian parents, they don't want their kids going, you know, go everywhere. You stay home, you take care of the kids at home and stuff, you know. And that's how my parents are, but I'm trying to break it for my little sister and them so, you know, I can go out and then when they grow up, you know, my parents will be eased up on them, you know, take the pressure off them, you know, is that. Was that hard for you guys, you know, as first comers here to? Jesse, I mean, was it tough? I mean, uh, you're, you know, and we're going to get to Nancy because I think there's a double standard with, with the guys and the girls. <laughs> no, I think there is a certain amount of a double standard, but uh, basically we're all under the same boat if you really look at the okay. whole picture. I think, uh, for example, with me, um, I was forced to go to Sunday school all the way up to my freshman year in college. Uh, I disagreed with it at the time. Mm -hmm. But now that I, I'm much older and, and, and thinking back of why, because there are certain moments in my life when I could have become one of those uh, gangbangers, really. Uh, Sometimes I, I cringe and when I think about it, I say, oh, man, you were so close to being on the other side because, you know, the difference between the penthouse and the outhouse is not very big. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just the same. And, and uh, looking at it, it's somewhat of the, the traditions that my parents hung on to is probably what saved my life. And for as much as we don't like, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I agree with the fact that not the whole, the whole Samoan culture mm -hmm. doesn't work here. Right. But at the same time, uh, like he, he referred to earlier, you know, in the, in the Polynesian way, the authority comes from the adult. The authority comes from our parent. And what our parent says goes. But we need to learn to communicate with our parents because we were so compressed as children that we, have no right to even explain ourselves. That's but, an island but if culture, we learn how to though. right, that's part of our culture. Right. But if we learn how to communicate and reason, our parents will give in sooner or later. But they won't give in completely, mm -hmm. but they'll give in to the point where both parties are comfortable. That's a good that's a good issue. Communicate with parents. And and Stephanie, you know, we, we what about you? What what do you think are some of your concerns? What would you like to ask? Um, I have like two main issues that I want to come across. Um, first of all I'm half Tong and half Samoan, and it's kind of hard for me to, um, you know, come together as one. And the second one is, um, I look all I look up to all of you guys. It's just that, will you give back to c the community? Because a lot of people have that main concern, like you're going, you're succeeding, and you forget about your culture. What do you do about it? That's, uh, well, the, look who's succeeding. I mean, Jesse, you're succeeding. I mean, you know, what, that's a good question. Let's ta tackle that one real quickly. How do you feel about that? About people thinking that um, I'm forgetting about my culture? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the one way that 
um, I can answer that question is, is being involved with my church and the same type of church that I was involved in growing up. Uh, believe it or not, after all the, the lights and ABC TV, mm -hmm. I go down to LA during the off season and I go to church in Compton. And a lot of the, my Samoan people there, in the beginning, mm -hmm. were wondering, what are you doing here? Why do you come here? But for me personally, I know deep in my heart, that's the only way I can keep an even keel. Mm -hmm. I can, because I know that when it's all over and done with, they take off the number 61 and the 49er label on my chest, I become the Samoan kid that was born to my mm -hmm. parents. That's true. And that's the way it is. And I, yeah. I've come to that realization. And I know that it won't be hard for me to make the transition after I retire from professional football because I've, I've stayed with my culture and stayed around the people that I grew up with. And that's, that's the fact of life. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. I mean, briefly, do you have a, a burning question you want to ask here? <laughs> well, some members of the Polynesian community are wondering, what have you done for the Samoan community besides being involved in your church? Obviously, you've, you know, he's out on the playing field a lot of times, but I mean, uh, well, I guess, Jesse, what I want to say is there's extra pressure because you're a football star mm -hmm. that the community looks to you and you've, you know, you've got to give so much back. How do you feel about that? Well, I have a, a junior youth group that I'm mm -hmm. involved with in Compton, mm -hmm. and there's about 40 kids. Uh, some of them are getting scholarships to go uh, to play football in a uh, Division I football, four-year college. Some of them did drive-by shootings two years ago, and some of them graduated from college. Uh, two girls graduated from college and uh, now are becoming nurses. It's a mixed group, and I think it's very healthy to have a mixed group. Mm -hmm. And two weeks ago, well, I don't, I don't want to mention any dates, but I brought them up for the Cincinnati game, and I, I put them up in, in a hotel, 40 of them, got them 40 tickets, and sent them to the game. They but the, the main reason, they were ecstatic, but that wasn't the reason I brought them up. I just wanted them to see what my field and my, my profession is like. They have this picture of professional football is guys putting on a helmet and running on a football mm -hmm. field, mm -hmm. but they don't know that the 49ers have 15 secretaries, mm -hmm. insurance people, accountants, uh, operators. Uh, it's a whole corporation. And I wanted the girls to know also that they can also work for the 49ers mm -hmm. or the Detroit Lions or the LA Raiders. I mean, that's what all those people contribute to the Perfect. success of a football team, mm -hmm. not just 45 strong guys who run on a football <laughs> or Jerry Rice who's fast and catch a pass. We have the secretaries and everybody, PR office Excellent. people mm -hmm. that come together and they had a broader understanding of what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. It's not just me putting on the helmet and going out there and blocking right. somebody. Well, we like you doing that, by the way, Jesse, <laughs> and we want you to keep doing that. I have to pay you my know, I, I wish we could have, you know, six hours talking about the issues that concern all of us. But I certainly want to thank my guests, Jesse Sapolo, of course, Nancy Lomu, and Salesi Katango. It's been excellent. I wanted to thank the audience uh, because it's been a fabulous, quick half hour. The program, the New American Pacific Islanders. Special thanks to everyone who participated. Everybody's been terrific, and thank you for joining us. I hope we've all gained a new awareness of some of the concerns of Pacific Islanders. On behalf of the staff and crew at KCSM-TV, I'm Jan Yanihiro.